verses 12 through 14. Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Then the Pharisees said to him, you are testifying on your own behalf. Your testimony is not valid. Jesus answered, even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid because I know where I have come from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from or where I am going. You judge by human standards. I judge no one. Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is valid, for it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. In your law, it is written that the testimony of two witnesses is valid. I testify on my own behalf, and the Father who sent me testifies on my behalf. Then they said to him, Where is your father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. He spoke these words while he was teaching in the treasury of the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. That's a habari zasabui, watu. <laughs> yes. I am a co-founder of a charity called Orphans Africa with my wife and our friend Lisa. And we build self-sustaining schools for orphan children in Africa, in Tanzania. Wayne had the opportunity to go with me in September and October last year. So we're going to have a discussion up here about that, and Wayne will be able to tell you some things. And at the end, maybe a few questions from you. Good morning, Wayne. Good morning. <laughs> so Jesus is the light of the world. What's the scriptural basis for supporting orphans? I'm going to go ahead and stand because it just feels weird to be seated. Most of, most of my life, I've been standing in front of groups. So, no, yeah, that's all right. I, mean, I, I think they gave us the chairs because they think at some point I'm going to stop talking. <laughs> so, in today's lesson, Jesus declares, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. As followers of Christ, we are to reflect that light in our lives and in our dealings with others. In Matthew 5, Jesus tells his disciples, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and hide it under a basket. They put it up on the lampstands and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others. The Old Testament spends a lot of time on the law and sorting out what that means and kind of clarifying. There are no fewer than 31 verses in the Old Testament that talk about caring for widows and orphans or doing justice for widows and orphans. Obviously, it's pretty important. Later on in Matthew 25, Jesus summarizes all of these with a story. The king is talking to one of the groups. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? And the king will reply, Truly, I tell you, whenever you did this for one of the least of my brothers and sisters, you did it for me. New Testament book of James is a little more direct. It says, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for widows and orphans in distress. 
pretty straightforward there. So there's a number of ways that you can reflect that light of Jesus, through words, through your deeds, through the way you deal with others. Personally, I kind of uh, like the saying that's been attributed to St. Francis, preach always, when necessary, use words. Wayne, what on earth possessed you to get involved with Orphans Africa? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> well, um, this is going to be weird because I'll be talking with you kind of third person-ish. I can but handle that. I had the opportunity to hear Carl speak a few times about their work in Orphans Africa, and it really got my attention. It was like one of those little taps on the shoulders or those tugs that say, pay attention to this, this may be important. It's been my um, experience that once you feel one of those tugs or that tap, you should pay attention to it and respond. So I talked to Carl and said, so I'd like to help. What, you know, what can I do? And he invited me to Tanzania. He said, well, come along and see what we're doing. <laughs> I was pretty dumbfounded. I mean, Really, can't I just like stuff envelopes or something? You know, there we are. Were you involved in African things before Orphans Africa? Short answer is not really. Uh, for some years, Vicky and I sponsored a couple of African children and we were able to correspond with them as they were growing. But, you know, that doesn't really count as being involved in Africa. Uh, so as a choral person, I, I'm aware of a lot of music that originated in Africa and even more that has African rhythms, African mo modalities and harmonies. And usually when I did one of those with the choir, I'd try and find out, you know, what was going on? What's the background? What's the atmosphere in which this was written? Uh, for example, there's a group of South African freedom songs that were written in response and in protest to the South African apartheid policies. For the most part, though, Africa was kind of this continent-sized blank spot on the map. I mean, it could have said terra incognita, there be monsters here. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's known as the dark continent, or used to be, because there was so little information about it. People didn't go there didn't know anything about it. Well, and I think that's, for most of us, that's the way it is still. Right. Once you committed to go to Tanzania, what did you do to get ready? Hmm. I think the easy ones are the ones you think about first. You have to get all the shots, including polio. Who knew? It's on the rise in a lot of places in the world. And my doc was saying, well, it depends on how much you trust that shot you got when you were like a toddler. I got the shot. Then you have to pack. You have to take everything you need for a month, plus still save room to take materials for the schools. Like, how do you pack a soccer ball? So, and the other thing, lifesaver, take noise canceling headphones. They're a lifesaver on a 14 hour flight, especially if you have a toddler sitting right behind you. Screaming toddler. Screaming toddler. The, the harder part is getting ready mentally and emotionally. I mean, how do you prepare yourself to visit a country where everything is so different? Median age is 18 years old, and only 4% of the population is over age 60. That one hit pretty close to home. I'd be one of the old guys, no matter where I was in the whole country. And there's a reason why the median age is so young. There's disease and there's lack of adequate medical care. For many Tanzanians who don't have access or can't afford medical care, the best thing available is someone to take them over and put them in the shade and hope they re recover. Kind of worried me a little bit with the basket load of medications I take every day. And I hope I didn't have any medical emergencies while I was there. Mwazo is our in-country manager. He handles the programs in Tanzania. He broke his arm in a car accident last January, a year ago, and it wasn't set right. And 
They fussed with it for several times and finally got it set right. But in September, when we were there, he still didn't have full use of his arm because of the medical care. And then, of course, Carl prepared me. Said, uh, well, I think at times he was trying to talk me out of it. And I said, there's bugs and there's rats and mosquitoes and there are spiders this big around. I'm like, okay, good, sign me up for that. Um, and I, the other part is you need to be ready for 110 degrees and stifling humidity. What he didn't prepare me for was the unseasonable cold snap while we were there. I saw uh, most of the locals were wearing jackets or sweatshirts. I saw one woman wearing a full length puffy coat and for us, it was great. I mean, it was really cold for the locals, but for us, it was nice. It was like 85 to 90 degrees the entire time we were there. But apparently that was cold. Well, what were your impressions of Tanzania? Wow, there's a lot to unpack there. And I was teasing Courtney earlier that we'd take a break halfway through and you know let people stand and stretch, get some coffee, walk around a little bit. It's different. It's a lot of dirt roads. I was really glad we weren't there in the rainy season. You don't see stores. I was there for three weeks before I saw anything that kind of looked like a store. Mostly they're small shops or roadside stands. And it seems like everyone is working on their own to try and earn a living, which is probably pretty accurate because there aren't any safety nets. While we were out visiting the school, we visited Mwazo's brother-in-law. Now here's a person that's educated. He has a degree in logistical management. During COVID, he lost his job at the port, but there's no unemployment to draw on. So he went back and moved across the country to work, as he says, as a peasant trying to raise enough money on their two acre patch or raise enough food on their two acre patch to feed his young family. There's no other options. If your parents die as an orphan, there's no CPS, there's no foster home care, you're on your own. With precarious employment, marginal health care, consistent disease, you can see how life is full of stress. People themselves don't have a lot of resources. A typical laborer in Tanzania might make in the neighborhood of $40 a month. <laughs> Embarrassing to say, but Vicki and I spend that much at Starbucks in a month's time. A, t a teacher might make $300 to $350 a month. About two weeks in, I mentioned to Carl that I hadn't seen any graffiti anywhere in the country. And his reply was, well, spray paint costs money. I mean, think about that one for a minute. How close do you have to manage your resources if a, a can of spray paint is a major purchase? I was also really struck by how much Orphans Africa had accomplished. This is the 15th year of Orphans Africa. In that time, they built dozens of schools, got a dozen, dozens of projects that have been initiated and up and running. 15 years ago, when Carl first visited uh, Tanzania, at Mwaji Secondary School, there were two classes. One was in a bamboo shack, and the other was outside underneath one of the big trees. Hopefully it wasn't raining. Now, there's a fully functioning campus with classrooms, dormitories, cafeteria and food service, uh, residential buildings for the staff. It looks like a real live functioning school. OA operates under the model of self-sustainability. It's not just, we'll give you the money and you go take care of it. It's like, let's help you make some supporting projects to help support the schools. Wayne, let's stop here and have you tell us what were some of your experiences with the people, and I'll let you do all the crying. 
People, people are amazing. They're so warm and welcoming. Uh, they greeted us like we were an integral part of the family, like long lost brothers. Respect's a big thing. Uh, maybe because other resources are so scarce. It's reflected in the way they greet each other, the way they make sure to include in the infirm and elders. Um, one of the organizations that OA pairs with in Africa is Maryland's Orphans Project, or MOB. That's easier for me to say than Maryland's Orphans. So I'm going to say MOB. So as we met with the MOB board, they took us to visit Maria who had been a cook at one of the nursery schools for several years. Uh, during surgery, she had a stroke and was pretty much housebound. She was just able to get up and walk a little bit. But they took us to visit her because she's an integral part of what they do. She maybe wasn't working, but she was still a part. So Kita is the chair of the mop board. We got to go visit his mama. So we had the entire mop board, seven people, and Carl and I crammed into her six foot by eight foot room that included the bed. So I was the one sitting next to her. And while we were visiting, she kept like shaking my hand. You know, the whole time. So her granddaughter finally came in and said, well, do you recognize all of these people? And she pointed at me and said, well, this one. Okay, there we go. How great is it that the elders are included, that they're part of what, what is happening every day, that Kita thought it was important that we go visit his mama. Then, of course, there's the children, the why. So we've all heard about Africa and about all the hardships, about the disease, lack of opportunities. But once you see the children and meet them, it's kind of like taking all that data and transforming it into a real, live, living human being. At Mbosi Nursery School, I got to watch a teacher teaching these three, four, and five-year-olds. And it was, he was so creative in the way he went about things. So he'd have volunteers, he was teaching about vowels. He'd have volunteers come to the front and name the vowels. To support that little one, every, once they were done, everyone else in the class blew kisses to him. Mwah! Mwah! <laughs> it's so cool to see like these 24-year-olds just really getting into it. Their energy is so, so infectious. I got infected with them, and I couldn't help but want the best for them. I also couldn't help but think about my own 18-month-old granddaughter and how many more opportunities she'll have just because she was fortunate enough to be born in this country. Older students are a little more clear about their story. We've talked about Moazo. He became head of his household when he was six years old. He had a four-year-old brother and a two-year-old sister to take care of. I can't imagine. He, sa he says that when he was eight, he considered taking his own life because it was so, so hard. It will also tell you that God stepped in and, and saved him and stopped him from doing that. Adrati is a student at Mwaji Secondary School. He talks about, after going to live with his auntie, that they care about you, but it's not the same as your own parents. If you're an orphan that's taken in, you're kind of a hardship, and you are lower on the totem pole than all the rest of the children in the family. In Tanzania, they say, everyone is entitled to education. <laughs> what the government doesn't tell you is that you have to pay for it. From nursery school all the way through university, it requires tuition. So how do you do that if you're an orphan? Adelina, who's a 22-year-old senior, Form 4, at Mwaji, wants to be a doctor. She's 22. So it's not unusual for orphans to be older than many other students at their level. 
because their education do doesn't always happen in a straight line. They can go to school only when they can. And oftentimes they have to wait until they find Orphans Africa. But she was so grateful when we were interviewing her she asked us to tell Orphans Africa and Orphans Africa donors, thank you so much for your kindness. I love you more, more, more. You know her options would be very limited if she didn't have an education. She knows that too. One of the cool, I know I'm kind of going on, but one of the cool stories I've got to tell you, Ziana is a graduate of the vocational school. And so she's working as an auto, at an auto repair shop in Vwawa. And she aspires one day to have her own shop. So she told a story about working under a car and it fell on her. She said, if I had been a boy, I would have been too scared to go back. But I... <laughs> But after she recovered, she was back to work. <laughs> go, yeah, you go, girl. <laughs> so each one of these, each one of these people had opportunities because of their education. They have a chance. We made a difference. For the people here in the church, what does God want for these orphans, Wayne? In John 10, Jesus says, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. I'm pretty sure the orphans, orphans are included in that. I can't imagine that he meant that promise only for those people in developed countries who have both their parents. The orphans, these least of these, are included in that, that promise. That's why Orphans Africa flips the script. In Tanzania, orphans are looked down on. They're a burden. I mean, who's there to take care of them? I mean, don't make me take care of them. I have enough problems taking care of myself and my family. OA comes in and says, we love the orphans. These little ones are important too. And they are worthy to have opportunities as well. We'll do what we can to help provide some pathways. Orphans are allowed to dream of a better future. So Wayne, what is it you want to tell others about this? Hmm. You don't have to do a lot to make a big impact. I mean, if you can, that's great, you know, bring it on. But you don't have to be wealthy to make a difference. I mean, don't forget, this is a country where spray paint is a major purchase. The $40 that Vicki and I spend at Starbucks in a month, embarrassing, could buy health insurance for a dozen students at an OA-supported school for an entire year, the whole year. I wish I had health insurance that would be like that price. In Deuteronomy 24, there's a whole series of verses that talk about caring for widows and orphans. If you leave, accidentally leave a sheaf in the field when you're gathering up the, the grain, let it there for the widows and orphans. If don't strip your olive trees after harvest, let what's left for the widows and orphans. Don't glean the leftover grapes from your vines, but leave them to provide for the widows and orphans. I always kind of thought that was kind of a metaphorical thing but in Tanzania, it's a reality. It's not unusual to see little biddies, little orphans out there gathering up individual kernels of corn off the ground after the harvest, because that makes a difference for dinner. One kernel of corn. In that environment, what we consider a little could make a significant impact. Well, I've been at Orphans Africa for 15 years at the end of this last year, and yesterday was our 15-year celebration. Thank you to those who came. So it has been a work of love, and the light of Jesus 
has shone forward all of those years. It is a message that Jesus gave long ago. It is a message even farther back in the Hebrew scriptures, as Wayne told you earlier. This is nothing new. But for us here in the West, far, far away from that severe poverty, it's easy to overlook God's other children. Children are important. We would like to answer any of your questions if you have any. I'm sure Wayne can answer them. Oh. <laughs> I think they want somebody who knows something. I don't know. <laughs> Mr. Catherine. Yesterday in the video, I noticed that some of the students were speaking English. Are they educated in both their own language and English, or is that a foreign language they can take? Or? Well, it is a foreign language, and English is taught as a subject in Tanzania in elementary school. In the secondary schools, they teach in English, and the students are to learn English. However, I have spoken with secondary school students in English, and I have no idea what they're saying. <laughs> so it's very uh, different. It's, their English is better than my Swahili. <laughs> to be fair, I've spoken in English, and Carl can't figure out what I'm talking about. So. <laughs> That's pretty normal, Wayne. <laughs> We have. Widows and orphans. Yes, that's in the scripture. Financially, I wish we had the revenue sources to engage in those kinds of things. But we are always overburdened with the amount of poverty and the uh, many, many orphans we have. We have hundreds of children in school year round. So it's an ongoing requirement to fund projects and you know feed these kids provide the insurance the clean water and the education early in our days we helped several widows we would provide a pig or some farm animals to help them get out of poverty but currently we don't have funds to continue those types of things but thank you for recognizing the scripture because widows have also had it tough when they are in severe poverty The widowers, they're on their own. <laughs> uh, just like here, you would expect someone to be working and trying to provide for themselves. So that we don't have any funds for the widowers either. Justice. Yeah. Um, wow, I put a little too close Hot to my nice. mouth. <laughs> um, I was wondering, I know that you're providing education. Do you also provide lodging? as well as the education and food that you're talking about? Is it a boarding school or is it just uh, a school that people come to and then they have to go home to a family that sees them as a burden? Well, good question. Uh, we have six school programs in five locations. Nursery schools, they're walk-to schools because they're local kids in the neighborhood, destitute, many of them. The secondary school has dormitories for boys and girls as well as our vocational college. So. Food is provided to all the kids. Medical insurance is provided to all the orphan kids. We don't teach doctrine. We're a non-secular institution, but we do allow their culture to do the things they want to do. It's about two-thirds Christian, a third Muslim, and 10% either nothing or animism. Our high school has an hour on Friday afternoon when school's out for religious classes, and the students run them. They do that voluntarily. I think uh, it's important to know too that like at Mwaji at the secondary school, there are dormitories with uh, school or with dormitory moms. Um, before the dormitories were built, students would be walking from Takuyu, which is about 17 kilometers away to get to school. So they may start out, you know, two hours ahead of time to get to school. Um, one of the other things that Michelle talks about is uh, we found that a number of the female students were being harassed on their way to school. So that made having an on-campus dormitory pretty important. The, the food, I, I think you need to tell the story. Okay, the story of Uzia. 
she was a, about a 16 year old girl that I interviewed at our high school and this was years ago before we had a food program and a, a water well but the kids came in droves to be educated and I interviewed this uh, 16 year old girl and she was living in what would be called a grandma's home a widow with four other orphans who slept on a mat on the floor and the grandma tried to provide as best she can and I asked her if she had any food to eat today and she said no and what did you have yesterday and she would say well I had maybe a half a banana and the day before well I had a mandazi which is a piece of bread what about the day before that well I had a banana and this went on and I'm thinking you know if I was her I'd be out looking for something to eat I wouldn't be at school and I said asked her Uzia how is it you can come to school every day when you are so hungry and her reply I'll never forget she said I can be hungry at home or I can be hungry at school I want to go to school I want an education that's how badly these kids want to get out of poverty and as you know we've turned graduate students into all kinds of occupations and it is the way out of poverty plus it ends suffering that's why the food service on campus became very very important can i ask one more question how does oa help the schools become self-sustaining we have multiple projects such as crops and livestock we are building commercial projects off-site to raise fish in commercial fish tanks, pigs, chickens, guinea, uh, avocado trees, a mango farm. These are all in development, but they're underway and doing well. So the idea is we want the Tanzanians to be independent, not dependent on us. So for the future, they take care of themselves, they can be proud, and you can be proud that you help them out of poverty. Thank you so much, everyone. We appreciate it. Thank you.